on their first day with no cooling, about a hundred pull-ups across the time frame that they had. Then they came back and did the cooling. They did it the very next day and they found that they went to 180 pull-ups, which is incredible. It's a near doubling. And by doing this repeatedly over several sessions, over several weeks, they quickly went in the cooling group from 180 and 200 to 600 pull-ups in the equivalent amount of time. They then repeated this in a study on the bench press, actually had a control group that was admittedly taking specific amounts of anabolic steroids, and the cooling group basically left all other groups in the dust. It was just remarkable. Well, in order to understand that, you have to understand that the body has three main compartments for regulating temperature, okay? We don't just have a center and a periphery. We have three main compartments. And there's one compartment in particular that all of you, or most all of you, I have to assume have. And if you can understand how that works, you can do tremendous things for your performance and for your recovery. So what I'm about to tell you will allow you to perform better in all forms of exercise. And it is not commonly known unfortunately, which is there are three locations on your body that are far better at passing heat out of the body and bringing cool into the body such that you can heat up or cool your body everywhere very quickly. Those three areas are your face, palms of your hands, and the bottoms of your feet. Now, the skin on your hands and on the bottoms of your feet, and to some extent on your face, are called glabrous skin. And what's special about those areas of your body and the glabrous skin is that the arrangement of vasculature, of blood vessels, capillaries, and arteries that serve those regions is very different different than it is elsewhere in your body. But all mammals have hair on their bodies. So some people have very light hair or very fine hair. You don't have hair on these glabrous skin regions. Now, of course, you can have beard or facial hair growth, but there's still regions like the cheeks and other areas that maintain this special vasculature, okay? So technically the hands and feet are real glabrous skin and the face is not always quite classified as glabrous, but these three locations, face, hand, palms of hands, not tops, and bottoms of feet are very good at dumping heat and bringing in cool. And the reason is blood flows typically from arteries to capillaries to veins and then back to the heart. But AVAs are direct connections between the small arteries and the small veins. They bypass the capillaries to some extent. Okay, so this is vitally important. I realize we're getting down into the mechanistic weeds here, but you need to know that these three compartments of your body, palms, bottoms of feet, and face are your best leverage points for manipulating temperature to vastly improve physical performance. Recovery is obviously vital, right? During a weight training session or during an endurance session, that's just the stimulus for getting better the next time. And if you don't recover, you not only won't get better, but you'll get worse. Typically, what we see is people cooling their core, cooling the back of their neck, cooling the top of their head. So it might be, you know, a, a sponge with cold water over the top of the head or an ice pack on the back of the neck, or in some case, even wearing cold ice vests. Right? This has actually been done. That's going to be a very inefficient way to improve recovery of that kind. Submerging the body in an ice bath or taking a cold shower, terrible way to cool off the body quickly compared to the ways that I described through. And in addition, if it's very cold and you submerge or you cover a lot of the body with that cold, you're going to cause constriction of the very vessels and pathways that allow the body to efficiently dump heat. So again, the key thing is to cool these one or two or three of these surfaces, but not so cold that you cause the, the vasoconstriction. So what does this mean for you? It means that getting in an ice bath or a cold shower or putting an ice pack on the back of your neck in most cases is not going to be as good as splashing cold water on your face or even just holding your face with, with a damp, cool cloth or something of that sort. Many people are are now relying on things like cryotherapy, which requires a lot of expensive equipment, big nitrogen driven uh, machine that those aren't so common uh, for most people or accessible for most people. But a lot of people are using cold baths or ice baths or cold showers. And again, that's not going to optimize recovery. In fact, it's going to have an additional effect that is going to potentially block the training stimulus. When you get into an ice bath, indeed, there are provided it's not very, very cold. If you get into a cold shower, provided it's not very, very cold, you are indeed blocking some of the inflammation that occurs because of the training session. But in doing so, you also are blocking pathways such as mTOR, which are involved in the adaptation for a muscle to become stronger or bigger. Put simply, covering the body in cold or immersing the body in cold after training can short circuit or prevent the hypertrophy or muscle growth response. It has other effects that can be positive, right? It can induce thermogenesis, et cetera. It can reduce inflammation, but it can prevent some of the positive effects of exercise. Now, it hasn't been examined so much for endurance work, but let's say you come back from a round of endurance work, a run or a bike or a swim, getting into a cool bath or cooling the, the palms, the bottoms of the feet or the face, in my opinion, based on the science, would be better than completely immersing the body in the ice bath. If you are out for a run and you want to incorporate this cooling mechanism, I talked to Craig about this. I said, what would be the kind of uh, uh, poor person's approach to this before this device is uh, commercially available? And he said, well, you, you could take a, uh, a frozen uh, juice can, uh, if you have one of those, or a very cold can of soda, and you would want to pass it back and forth 
between your two hands. The reason the passing back and forth is really important is because you, again, you don't want to be so cold that you constrict those venous portals that it will allow cold to go into the body. Caffeine for somebody who doesn't drink caffeine very much will constrict the blood vessels and will increase retention of body heat and is probably a bad idea before exercise. For somebody who's caffeine adapted and is used to drinking caffeine, it won't have that vasoconstriction effect. That's what the data point to because I'm adapted to it. And, but it will cause vasodilation and will allow me to dump body heat. So for me, I use it before I train or do any kind of exercise because I tend to do that early in the day. It won't prevent me from sleeping and it causes vasodilation. And then afterwards, I'm aware that it causes vasoconstriction after the caffeine wears off. So for somebody who drinks two or three or more cups of coffee a day or mate a day, so we're talking intake of anywhere from 100 to 400 milligrams of caffeine, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you would do that before exercise and probably not after exercise. That just makes logical sense, given what we know about thermal regulation. And if you're somebody who doesn't drink caffeine, drinking caffeine before a workout is going to be about the worst thing you could possibly do because it's going to increase core body temperature through its thermogenic effects, and it's going to constrict your blood vessels and make it even harder to dump heat. So I don't suggest that people drink caffeine or not. I just suggest that you think about whether or not you're caffeine adapted or not and decide whether or not you want to drink caffeine in general. You're going to be better not drinking any caffeine than you are drinking caffeine unless you're a heavy caffeine user or abuser, in which case not drinking caffeine is going to give you vicious headaches and is going to make it very hard to get motivated because you're just not used to it. It takes about three weeks to get used to no caffeine. It's brutal. I've done it before. I've done caffeine fast. I don't know that I ever want to do it again. That's how painful it was. But you get headaches because of the effects on vasodilation and constriction. If you like caffeine, use in moderate amounts and use it before your workouts, not after. If you don't like caffeine or you don't use it very often, stay away from it anywhere close to exercise before or after for that matter.